Okay, in chapter 10, we're going to talk a little bit about gene isolation and manipulation. Um, in the last few chapters, we've kind of looked at how uh, the process of DNA replication, uh, transcription of genes from DNA, translation of that RNA uh, from transcription into actual proteins who go and then have some sort of function within the cell. And so now we're going to look at how we actually isolate and manipulate some of these mechanisms uh, for the purpose of molecular biology and genetics, medicine, etc. Once again, here is your uh, chapter 10 outline for your reference. So one of the crucial insights in genetics uh, that has led to this molecular revolution that is uh, ongoing is that uh, within genetics, we can harness some of this uh, uh, nascent or already there machinery um, and we can also take genes that are already created in different individuals and kind of mix and match and swap out uh, some of these things for our uh, either the betterment of crop production in the case of GMOs um, or through gene therapies uh, and things of that nature. So we'll get into a little bit of how these processes are done um, and what is um, uh, what we're capable of in genetic manipulation. So one of the earliest um, genetic manipulations and probably one of the most key to this day is the idea that we can take a gene that we're interested in and amplify it uh, to make many copies of it. So if we're going to study a gene, for instance, say we're interested in a gene for uh, how drought resistant plants are, um, we could either grow a ton of these plants and remove this gene over and over and over again for our hundreds and hundreds of plants, or we can remove that gene, purify it, and then find ways to amplify that gene for us to study um, and amplify it in a test tube rather than having to grow the same organism over and over and over again and reharvest it. And so uh, there's really two ways that we're going to discuss right here of how we amplify that gene. So the first thing that we do is we have this gene of interest. Um, as stated before, we're gonna use the example of a drought resistant gene in something that you eat like corn. And so we take that gene and we use restriction enzymes and we cut that gene out of its the host uh, genome, right? And so once that piece of DNA, that gene is cut out, we can then insert it or ligate it, as we say, uh, into a vector. And so a vector is the circular piece of DNA that we know where the promoter regions are. Remember, we need promoters for that transcription machinery to bind and then actually uh, turn that gene into RNA. Um, so we know where that is. There's also usually other things on here, selectable markers. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but these are things to help us ensure that we're only purifying the DNA we're looking for, not some weird bacteria that just so happens to uh, you know, reproduce in our media. So then uh, we have our origin here where the DNA polymerase will bind. It will continue to transcribe and transcribe this gene for us. And so then we have a copy of the gene. And it'll actually, and remember in bacteria, it'll actually just replicate this plasmid, uh, this vector over and over again. And so then we put that vector into bacteria. And so once it's in bacteria, remember those plasmids, those circular pieces of DNA in bacteria, they will be replicated and they will be uh, through each round of um, reproduction of the bacteria will also replicate that plasmid. So once we have that vector in bacteria, we then can just grow this bacteria over and over and over again. Now think of it in terms of time scale. If we were to use the plant as our way of reproducing this gene by just naturally allowing this corn plant to reproduce over and over again, for one corn plant to produce an offspring, it probably takes a full growing season, right? So four months maybe for corn to go from a kernel into a full plant that is gonna reproduce in the next generation. Now, instead of using that plant as our method of reproducing this gene, we put it into bacteria. And then in bacteria, the time scale for reproduction is much shorter. So E. coli, you know, it's a couple hours that these uh, 
bacteria will take to reproduce. So we're doubling that gene every couple hours as opposed to every nine months. And so once these bacteria get to a, some sort of critical threshold that we've established, um, usually that's uh, through optical density, so we can kind of see how many bacteria are there by how much light shines through this media, uh, we can then proceed to uh, destroy all these cells and pull out those plasmids that they've reproduced for us. So we've kind of used them as little factories to reproduce uh, this DNA, this gene of interest. And then we just cut that uh, gene back out of those vectors uh, using the same ligases that we saw up at the top here. And then all of a sudden we have, we went from a few copies of our gene of interest to thousands or millions of copies of our gene of interest. So the second way that we can do this is through uh, polymerase chain reaction or PCR. And so instead of cutting out this gene of interest and then putting into bacteria to replicate over and over and over again, what we can do is we can design primers, which are small complementary, uh, it's this yellow piece here, my arrow's not very good, a small complementary pieces of DNA that is just upstream of where our gene is. And so what we can do from that is we can warm the DNA up to a point that allows those two strands to separate. We call this the melting point. So those, at a certain temperature, those two DNA strands, the, the uh, anti-parallel strands, will pull apart. And that allows our little primer, which is this usually 22 to 25 base pair piece of DNA that is very specific to a sequence on both sides of the gene. So you see here in the yellow, we have one upstream and downstream of our gene. It allows, once those two strands are melted, that primer to sneak in there and bind in, uh, to the DNA at this complementary site. And now that that primer is bound there, the DNA polymerase sees it as a double-stranded uh, piece of DNA, and it will move in and start amplifying our gene. And so we do this in cycles. We use a thing called, some people call it a PCR machine, but I always was told it's a thermocycler. And so what it does is it raises the temperature to a point to melt the DNA and allow our primer to get in there. Once that has occurred, it lowers the temperature back down to a point that is very key for uh, this polymerase to allow extension. Um, and it repeats these cycles over and over again. The melting, uh, the annealing temperature where uh, those primers will attach to the DNA, the extension temperature where the polymerase works over and over again. And we run the cycle over and over and over, and it makes more and more copies of our gene. So these polymerases and all the components of this reaction are what are naturally in cells, right? So um, polymerate, DNA polymerase, which makes copy, DNA copies of genes, that's naturally in a cell. And so we've kind of harvested this machinery and manipulated ourselves for us to uh, replicate this gene in a test tube. So you really have two options here. You can do the molecular cloning that we talked about, or you can do PCR as a way to amplify a gene. So in the last slide, I talked a little bit about using restriction enzymes um, as ways to cut around the gene. So let's talk a little bit about restriction enzymes. So um, with, when you're doing molecular biology, um, back when I started doing it, we had these giant posters of restriction enzymes. And these different restriction enzymes had these unique, unique characteristics where different restriction enzymes recognize different sequences. And so in this case here, we have ECOR1 is one of our restriction enzymes. And so um, this is a restriction enzyme from uh, E. coli, um, and then it's numbered R1. So there's eco R1, eco R2, uh, a bunch of different ECOs. And, and the different names of these enzymes come from the organisms that they were first um, uh, found or discovered in. So eco R1 is an enzyme that will look specifically for the sequence of CTT AAG and its complement, GAATTC. Now, what's also unique about these or interesting about these restriction enzymes is they cut in a certain pattern. So you can see where these red arrows are, that this restriction enzyme, enzyme EK, uh, ECO R1, will cut after the last A and before that G on, the, on one strand, 
and then la after that last A and before the G on the other strand. And so what we end up with are these overhangs, right? So we have one overhang that is TTAA, and then a complementary overhang that is also TTAA. Now, uh, we call these in molecular bio biology sticky ends, because remember, just like we were talking about with mRNA, these nucleotides are wanting to form those hydrogen bonds. And so they're looking, they're kind of like magnets, right? They're looking to fulfill these bonds. And so when we want to paste a gene into this vector that we've cut with this restriction enzyme, what we want to do is leave sticky ends that are kind of complementary to this. And if we do that, it's real easy for us to paste that gene in. So if we look over here on the blue, the blue is our gene of interest, right? And so this is that drought gene from corn that is my example. I apologize that it's plants and your eyes are, are glazing over, but it's what I know. So in this case, we have our drought gene here. We're going to label it D. And on the two ends here, we found a cleavage site that is the same eco R1. And so now, if you look at our cleaved gene on the right hand side here in blue and our cleave vector on the left hand side here in red and we look at these overhangs so we have that overhang of AATT on one end and then AATT on the other end. Now because this is kind of a palindromic uh, sequence this both sides are going to look for AATT in whatever sequence it binds. Now, if we look at our gene of interest, because we use that same restriction enzyme to cut the gene out, we so happen to have that exact same overhang, right? So if we were to put these two pieces of DNA, our opened vector and our gene of interest into a test tube with ligase, an enzyme meant to paste things together or ligate things together, then we're going to get this gene to look for those hydrogen bonds in this vector that's also looking to fulfill those bonds between A's and T's. And it's going to paste in the proper way in the exact location that we want it. So this is leaving these sticky ends with um, overhangs that are looking for their complement. And remember, T's always look for A's, A's always look for T's, and then G's and C's go together. So if we have a different piece of DNA that randomly got cut where we have G uh, G, C is an overhang, it's not going to fit here, right? Because A's have to be with T's and T's have to be uh, with A's. And so this is not its right complement. So long story short, um, using restriction enzymes give us specific overhangs. And leaving these overhangs, we can kind of decide which piece of DNA should be pasted into what uh, vector or host genome or things of that nature. So here we have a little more uh, detail into inserting recombinant DNA uh, for cloning. Um, so again, uh, just like our previous slide, we have a vector where we um, form some sort of cleavage, in this case with ECOR1. Uh, so we have that uh, AATT overhang. And we also have our donor DNA uh, that we're going to cut with the same restriction enzyme with ECOR1. And so we're going to have these uh, AATT overhangs as well. Um, then we can uh, light or hybridize it into this vector. Um, so naturally, these AAs and TTs will line up because they're looking to fulfill that bond with their corresponding nucleotide if they're unpaired. Um, so once that occurs, then we finalize this process by using uh, an enzyme called DNA ligase. A uh, DNA ligase uh, is that same enzyme that we had talked about previously in the, um, the genetic replication or genomic replication uh, chapter. And the ligase's role is to fill in this little nick here where the backbone of the uh, DNA is, is missing. It hasn't formed that link between the previous uh, plasmid and the newly inserted gene. So DNA, DNA ligase comes in and fulfills that backbone 
and we end up with a full plasmid, uh, recombinant piece of plasmid DNA. So we're going to do a brief uh, overview here of PCR. Uh, Dr. Schultz at Louisiana Tech actually teaches a full class on PCR. Um, and so if you really want to get into the weeds of PCR, then he's the guy to go to. He's going to get really uh, heavily hit on it. And like I said, this uh, both cloning and PCR are very cornerstone um, techniques to molecular biology. So if you do want to have head into a career of molecular biology actually doing these gene manipulations then knowing PCR is very very important and I would recommend his course and so briefly PCR we have a region uh, a gene of interest we'll do that drought gene it's in orange here and so what we're going to do is use that thermocycler um, Back in the day before these thermocyclers or PCR machines, they actually had to do this by hand. And I think Dr. Schultz would actually make you do it by hand just to show you uh, for one of his examples, I believe. Don't quote me on that. Um, but what we do is we add the primers and the oligo, uh, oligonucleotides. So um, just random A's, T's, G's, and C's. Um, and we heat to that melting temperature that separates the two strands. And then once they're separated, we cool. Uh, back down to 55 or 65 degrees Celsius. And that allows those primers that we added to anneal to those exposed strands of that gene, right? Um, once we have those annealed primers, we heat it back up a bit to 72 degrees. And this is the temperature, optimal temperature for the elongation and the um, polymerase to come in and actually make complements to those single-stranded genes. And so now we have what was originally a single copy of that gene has now become four copies, right? So now we repeat the heat, uh, heating and cooling again. So we reopen those two strands and we allow the cooling for the annealing of more primers to anneal. So now where we started with two strands, we have four open strands and they have primers uh, annealed to them. We repeat step four, which was the elongation step. And where we started with two copies of the gene, we're now up to eight copies of the gene. We repeat this step one more time. And so we pull apart uh, through the melting point. We allow annealing of primers because we dumped a whole bunch of these primers in there. So they're just amply floating around. Uh, we then allow, we allow them to anneal, then we allow the elongation step, so we heat up to 72 degrees roughly, to allow that um, TAC polymerase to extend, again, from those primers, extend our gene. And so now we're up to 16 copies. And so what's kind of hidden at the bottom here is if we do this 25 cycles, remember every time it's doubling, so we did 2, 4, 8, 16, but if we do this for 25 cycles, we'll have amplified that gene 10 to the sixth power. So was that over a million times? And so we have plenty of plenty of copies of these genes for us to do molecular work with. So one of the downfalls of using PCR is something specific to eukaryotes. And remember when we talked about eukaryotes, they're different than prokaryotes in that they have these regions called introns. And those introns are parts of a gene that are not actually turned into uh, protein. So they get spliced out during that splicing uh, from the spliceosome during that co-transcriptional process. And we end uh, up after transcription with a piece of mRNA that has no introns in it, right? And so if you're doing um, studies where you want to look at the actual mRNA or the protein product and you want to put that into bacteria to clone, you have to have those introns removed, right? Because if you're cloning a gene in bacteria from a eukaryote, say that drought resistant gene in corn, if we were to just PCR amplify it and then put it into bacteria or something of that nature to clone, well, those bacteria don't have the machinery to remove those introns. And so if we want to look at something that only has 
uh, the protein coding sequence and not all that intron junk, then we have to do uh, something like create cDNA. So what cDNA is, is a DNA version of that mRNA, because remember mRNA is not stable at all. And so even though mRNA has those introns removed and it's only exons, we can't really store mRNA. So we need something stable to store this processed uh, protein coding piece of RNA. And so what cDNA is, is it's a DNA version of that mRNA that you can store. And we create these things called cDNA libraries. So we can actually take a whole bunch of the mRNA, turn them into a DNA version, and then they're much more stable and we can uh, study them uh, long term as opposed to trying to work with just RNA. So to do this, uh, what we do is we take mRNA that has been uh, transcribed in whatever your organism is, and we can pull out only the mRNA from an uh, organism and not all those other RNAs. Remember, we have functional RNAs like tRNAs and rRNAs, etc. There's a way to pull out only the mRNA, and it's because of this one unique characteristic that mRNA has that another, uh, no other RNA has. And you might remember that during this uh, processing, there is the addition of this poly A tail. So what we can do is use that to pull out only the RNA um, by having these beads that have a bunch of T's on it. So those A's are naturally gonna wanna stick to those T's and we pull out all that RNA. Then what we can do is use another mechanism that is from naturally evolved in organisms. It's this uh, enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And what reverse transcriptase does is it's a kind of like a polymerase, but instead of reading DNA and making mRNA, it does the opposite. And so we have a mRNA that we pulled out and we can turn that back into DNA with reverse transcriptase. And again, we need a primer in order to do this. Well, usually you have to design primers by knowing the sequence before and after your gene. But for this reverse transcriptase, we're lucky because we know that at the end of every mRNA is that poly A tail. So we can just make primers that are TTTT and we'll stick to that single-stranded RNA and make it double-stranded, and then our reverse transcriptase can start to go to work. So it will bind to this region where this trans or this uh, poly T, TTTT primer bind, uh, was bound to the poly A tail, AAAA, and it will start to turn that mRNA, which is red in this uh, picture here, into DNA. So once the uh, the reverse transcriptase is done making a copy of one strand of this mRNA, we can add um, enzymes that degrade or chemically degrade this mRNA and leave us with that single-stranded DNA. And from there, we then add DNA polymerase because we have single-stranded DNA and we can turn that single-stranded DNA into double-stranded DNA. And once that's done, we now have started with a gene at the very top here that is a gene that has introns and exons, and we've removed all of those introns and made a DNA version of only that gene. And in the case of DNA, uh, cDNA libraries, we can do this simultaneously to every piece of mRNA that's in the cell when we pull down everything with this poly A tail and kind of isolated only the mRNA. And now we've created cDNA backups of every piece of mRNA in the cell. So let's go back to uh, cloning or in vivo um, amplification. So remember we have two forms of amplification. We have cloning or in vivo um, and we have PCR, which was a way of doing it in a test tube uh, using uh, polymerase and the melting temperatures, etc. So with in vivo, uh, what we can do is, in this case, we have 
our donor DNA. So this is d DNA from whatever organism. It can be from um, a bacteria like E. coli, or it can be from humans, it can be from plants, it can be from anything that has DNA. And so in this case, uh, we have two genes that we are interested in. We have this green one, which we'll denote as uh, gene one here. And we have this purple one, which is denoted as gene two. And so as previously stated, we can cut this out with those restriction enzymes. So here we have these overhangs created from restriction enzymes. In the uh, chapter so far, we talked about ECOR1, um, but there's ECOR5, uh, all these different uh, um, BAMH1, all these different enzymes. So um, we'll say that we're using ECOR1 again, just for uh, continuation of what we talked about before. And then we cut our plasmid, our vector, uh, with the exact same enzyme, or at least an enzyme that gives us those same overhangs. Uh, so in this case, we'll use ECOR1 again. Um, and we do this for two different vectors. So we have this one over here, and we have the second one over here. And now, individually, we put each of those two genes uh, through transformation. We talked about in that uh, viral chapter, um, this way of transfecting bacteria and we can pass a current through this bacteria. Um, you can use chemicals, um, you can use the freeze-thaw method, um, but in essence what we're doing is we're taking this vector that we created, this plasmid, and we are putting it into these bacteria. And so for each the, uh, the gene number one and gene number two, we do this on two separate uh, experiments or two separate strains. And so we transform and we put those plasmids inside, which leads to us having um, two different strains of bacteria that each have one of those two genes of interest. And then we put them in some sort of media to culture them. Um, usually this is a liquid media, so we'll make like a, a LB broth it's called. Um, and we allow these bacteria to just reproduce naturally. And when they're doing this, uh, not only will they replicate the plasmids within themselves, but they'll also replicate themselves a bunch of times. And so when we started with this, in this case, a single plasmid, we now have uh, you know, thousands and thousands and millions of copies of this gene on this plasmid. And so from this point forward, then we can just lyse these cells. So we would, um, you can do it through uh, chemical lysis. Um, there's usually plasmid purification kits that will uh, chemically lyse and, and use centrifuges to kind of break up the cells. Then we can pull those plasmids out and use those same ECOR1 or, or whatever uh, restriction enzyme we used previously to cut those genes right back out. So as we talked about previously in this chapter, um, these plasmids that we use for cloning have a whole bunch of different um, features within them that allow for efficient and accurate cloning of genes. And so we're gonna talk about a few of them here. Um, so the first thing we're gonna look at is this polylinker site. And so this polylinker site is a site where within it, we have a bunch of mapped restriction enzyme sites and, and where they're gonna cut. So all these restriction enzymes up here, uh, HIND3, uh, BAMH1, ECOR1, et cetera, et cetera, those are all mapped out for us. So we know if we were to uh, treat this, this uh, plasmid with one of these enzymes that it will cut in that spot. And this is important because when we're gonna cut a gene out of whatever genome we're interested in, we'll go back to our, our corn drought gene. Our examples previously used ECOR1 every time, but it's possible that near our gene, there's no ECOR1 sites. Remember, that left us with that AATT overhang. Well, it's possible that the regions immediately flanking our gene don't have that AAT region. And so that restriction enzyme is only specific for that one sequence of DNA. And so we need to find a different restriction enzyme that's gonna cut near our gene. And so once we find that restriction enzyme that will cut near our gene, we can then go and look at the map of our vector and see if that same enzyme is in the spot that we need to insert our gene. And so um, these polylinker sites have just mapped out all the possible uh, recombination enzymes that will cut where we need to uh, 
uh, insert our gene into the vector. So another feature I want to point out is this uh, kind of teal, I suppose, blue or teal uh, region uh, that is AMP R. And so AMP R is a gene on this uh, vector for ampicillin resistance. And ampicillin is a very common uh, antibiotic uh, for bacteria, and we use it to screen bacteria. So remember, we're creating this vector by taking the vector and inserting a gene, and we do that all in a test tube first. And once we have our gene properly inserted into the vector, then we take a big mess of bacteria, and we do that transfection process where we either you know, use an electrical current or freeze-thaw method, etc., to put that vector into the bacteria. However, not 100% of those bacteria are going to take up our vector, um, and that's because it's just not 100% efficient. Um, and so some of those bacteria will still be alive, and they'll just have never taken up one, uh, one of those plasmids. And if we were going to clone our gene, we want to make sure that anything that didn't get our plasmid that is still just an empty bacteria, we want to kill those and get rid of them because it's just a waste of resources to make those reproduce if they don't have our gene that we're interested in. And so what we can do is grow all of those bacteria after we transfect them, we grow them in a media that has ampicillin. And so that way, we're only growing bacteria that have picked up this plasmid, this vector that we created, because everything that didn't get that vector doesn't have an ampicillin resistance gene, and they'll die. But everything that does have this vector is going to live. And so then we know also that we're amplifying our gene, because it's on that same vector. The last thing I want to point out on this vector is this purple lack z gene and so this lack z gene allows us to determine if we have a successful insertion of a gene so we've already talked about the problem with okay we've gotten rid of any bacteria that does not have the vector in it well another problem we can have is inserting our gene into this vector that's not 100 percent efficient either so it's possible that some of these bacteria, they will take up a vector that we failed to put our gene into. So it's just an empty vector. And because of that, they still get this ampicillin resistance. So we don't screen them out when we use ampicillin, but they aren't making copies of our gene because we failed to put 100% of those genes into 100% of the vectors, right? And so there's a way for us to screen for that, and that's with this LAX-Z gene. So what LAX-Z does is it's an enzyme that will convert um, XGAL, which is um, a component that we will um, spread onto our plates. It will cleave it and make this blue substance. So if there's no gene inserted into this polylinker site that we indicated earlier here, then that LAC-Z gene is intact. And so if that LAC-Z gene is intact, when we look at these colonies, when we spread them onto a plate, then that LAC-Z uh, intact gene will create colonies that are blue. And we know then that we inserted an empty vector into those colonies and we don't want them, right? We, we are only interested in ones where we inserted a gene. Now, if we accurately inserted a gene into that LAC-Z spot, this polylinker site that I've got about five arrows at here now, <laughs> um, if we accurately insert a gene in there, what happens is we break that LAC-Z gene because we put a big old another gene in the middle of it. And so it breaks it. It doesn't allow it to be a proper protein. And what happens then is when we plate out those individuals that have the vector, because we remember we did the ampicillin screening, and they turn into white colonies, we know that something got inserted into that laxy gene to break it. And so most likely, in the majority of cases, that is the gene that we put there on purpose. And so we have two different ways to A, make sure that every bacteria has a vector in it that was with ampicillin, and B, 
that that vector that we did put in there had our gene of interest. And that's kind of the theory behind blue-white screening. So plasmids are generally, like we talked about in our last slide, plasmids for blue-white screening, they're generally used to clone either one or a, you know, a couple genes. They're not used to clone big sections of DNA. Um, but there are tools that we can use to actually um, clone and make libraries of or, or manipulate large sections of DNA. And so if we're looking at doing something like the Human Genome Project or sequencing a novel genome where we actually are trying to clone entire an organism's entire genome as opposed to just a single gene, we need to pick a tool that is right for that. And so there are a couple other tools, not plasmids, but we have one called a phosmid. A phosmid is um, similar to a plasmid, but it, it can um, it can hold larger pieces of DNA. Um, so we can get uh, 35 to 45 kilobases, which is a big chunk of DNA when compared to um, a single gene. You know, a gene you might have one or two thousand base pairs, depending some bigger or some smaller. Um, and so we can use this to um, cover the genome and see when we're trying to cover an entire genome, it takes about 75,000 of these phosmids to cover the human genome. So it, this is a little more um, applicable if we're doing something that has a smaller genome than humans. Humans have quite a big genome when compared to things like Drosophila or um, Arabidopsis or a bacterial genome. Um, another option would be a BAC, which stands for a bacterial artificial chromosome. And so this is kind of like the chromosome in bacteria. Um, it can hold a lot larger size than a phosmid, up from 100 to 200 KB or kilobases. Um, <clears throat> and so to get full coverage of the human genome for this, you need a lot less than phosmids, um, more about uh, 15 to 30,000. Um, there's also yaks, which are yeast artificial chromosomes, and those hold even larger than BACs. Um, and we're not going to dive too deeply into these things, but just know that if you were doing work at a genomics level instead of a gene level, that you would use something, um, a better tool than plasmids for this cloning process. So say now we created a giant library containing all of the genes in a genome. So here we're going to say we, we have a phosmid library. So we've taken the genome of uh, corn we'll stick with corn, and we've broken it into 30,000 kilobase segments. So the entire genome is spread into all these multiple little colonies. It's fractured. And now we're interested in that drought gene that we talked about earlier. Our example of that drought gene is somewhere in one of these colonies. And we want to pull that out and start doing um, some cloning or some molecular work with it. But we have to figure out which library out of all these tiny dots here is the one that contains that fraction of the genome. And so there's a way that we can do this. So the first thing that we do is we transfer colonies to this absorbent membrane. And so what this is, is we take a, like a membrane or a kind of like a piece of filter paper almost that we lay over top of this or these colonies that we have in this petri dish. And what that does is it kind of takes a sample of all the colonies, right? So by laying it on top, some of those cells in each of those individual colonies, those dots, will stick to that membrane. So we're just taking a subsample of our plate. So assuming we know the sequence of the gene we're interested in, or at least part of the sequence, uh, what we can do is we can create a radioactive probe. And so what this is, is a probe that is specific to finding um, and binding to the mRNA or the protein product that is produced from our gene of interest. So if we have a um, radioactive probe for that drought gene, we'll have known the sequence that can bind to that mRNA that's produced from that drought gene. And it has a radioactive label on it. So remember how we talked about in those previous chapters about using uh, uracil or um, 
some sort of DNA probe that was grown in, in with ph radioactive phosphorus, etc. So very similar here where we create this probe that is got um, one of the elements is radioactive. And so it is going to go and bind to that mRNA that we are of our gene of interest and it's going to be radioactive. So now we wash that membrane and we lay it down on film. And so we've removed any excess radioactive probe that was floating around on that membrane. And all we have left are colonies where that probe should go into the bacteria and bind with any mRNA that it is specific for. And remember, these bacteria, only some of them are going to have our colony that is containing that part of the genome. So that probe is only going to bind to our gene of interest in individuals that actually contain that part of the genome, right? So when we lay it on radioactive paper, what's going to happen is that radioactivity is going to kind of cause that film to develop, and it's going to give you a position that from that plate of which colony has your gene of interest in it. So now that we know the position of the colony that has our gene of interest, we can go and we can use a little uh, forceps or a little uh, um, probe itself, not like a DNA probe, but like a physical probe <laughs> to go and pick that colony and put that into a liquid media and grow the colony up. And we know then that we're amplifying the gene that we're looking for um, and not just some random piece of the genome. So a second method that's very similar to this uh, radioactive probe use is using an antibody. So really what we're doing is we're just taking um, the, the probe idea and using it on protein instead. So here we have stored uh, the cDNA in a library, an expressive library. So it's a library that actually turns these the cDNA into proteins itself. And so what we do then is we plate it uh, similar to previously where we have all these colonies on a Petri dish. And then again, similarly, we take kind of a subsample here of the uh, Petri dish by overlaying a membrane. And this membrane will uh, kind of take that subsample from the master plate and have it bound to the membrane. And so as you can see here, the proteins are expressed in uh, this library. And so those proteins will then stick to the membrane itself. And we can take an antibody, a primary antibody, that is designed to bind to uh, this protein that we're looking for, our genes protein. Um, and then we wash that membrane. And then we incubate with a secondary membrane, so a membrane or sorry, not a membrane, a uh, antibody that sticks to that primary antibody, so a secondary an antibody, and that antibody is radio labeled. And so what we end up with is this antibody sticking to our protein, that was our primary antibody, and that is specific only to our protein of interest. And then the second wash with that second uh, antibody or second incubation with that second antibody is an antibody that is specific to our primary antibody. So it only sticks to our primary antibody and it is radioactive. So here we have iodine uh, 125. So again, we've identified colonies that are only uh, specific for that protein that we're interested in. And so then just like the pre previous method, we can overlay it with this uh, auto uh, radiography paper and that paper will indicate only colonies that have that uh, radio labeled probe attached to it, this antibody attached to it. And then uh, we can identify in our master plate here um, which colonies had that protein that we're looking for.